welcome to those of you guests. Uh, so this is the last of our public lectures in the Religions and Public Life series. Um, so uh, morning and national teeth is inappropriate. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to have Ray Barfield, who's got a problem with medicine, and um, Genesis School is going to introduce our um, speaker tonight. And uh, as usual, um, around 6.30ish or whenever things are closed, we'll, we'll have time for questions. But then uh, those of you who are part of the seminar, we will uh, traits across uh, to big tools and further conversation uh, in the room offices. All right. Um, well, we've just had a wonderful conversation, and um, it's just great to have you here, Susan. Um, Susan received her BS and her MS degrees in nutrition. That's where she started. Um, she worked in maternal child health as a nutrition educator at Boston South End Community Health Center and the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. And what struck me as I was sort of Googling her and finding out different things about her is that it was while she was embedded in these settings with patients paying attention to this work in nutritional education that she started to become interested in the ways that our beliefs and cultural factors affect healthcare choices. So instead of simply being fascinated by that, she decided to go and pursue an MTS at Harvard and a PhD in religious studies from Brown University. She then went on to serve as a consultant writer and editor for Partners in Health. She was an academic writer and editor at the Center for Health and Human Rights at, Har at the Harvard School of Public Health. And she was a medical writer for Brigham and Women's Hospital. <clears throat> In 2011, she joined the Global Health Institute at Harvard. And there she engages in projects that range from developing curricula to strategic planning, faculty leadership initiatives, website news and stories. And she's been the managing editor of three academic peer-reviewed journals. She's written three academic monographs, and two of them were published by Oxford University Press and she's the editor of a collected volume of essays. She writes and speaks as an international scholar on faith-based responses to poverty with a focus on health issues, and she's developing research to advance interdisciplinary education around the dynamics of urban environments and world health. That's just such an interesting background. So anyway, give Susan a warm welcome. Thank you so much for that generous in in introduction. Bear with me. Change glasses here. Okay, so now I can't see you, but I can see my paper. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, Again, thank you so much for this invitation. This is just an extraordinary seminar, and I, I, applaud, I applaud all of you for participating in it. And I'm, I'm acutely aware that my talk follows a daunting role of speakers. Tonight, I'd like to take you on a sort of journey through some key health and justice themes that balance between the present and the past and may help us imagine and shape connections toward global health for the world today. In early January of this year, I found myself in India, a long way from my comfort level in early Christian studies. And I was standing literally in the dry bed of the Ganges River. There on a broad floodplain south of Delhi, southeast of Delhi, in the city of Allahabad, every 12 years, according to the stars, a festival takes place called the Komela. There uh, at the largest gathering on earth, Hindu pilgrims, tourists, and others gather at the confluence of three sacred rivers to bathe or take a dip in that deity they call Mother Ganga. This colossal 55-day festival happens in a tent city that is temporarily supplied with miles of electrical lines and water pipes, temporary pontoon bridges, this is uh, them rolling it into place, there are many of them, and 40,000 toilet facilities. Workers come from all over India with their families to build the, and maintain and deconstruct the site 
And here you see a uh, Google Earth map of the area during the festival. And in the, the right lower corner is one of the children in the workers' camp. And I love this because it's, she's sort of clutching that, you know, her blanket, her, that universal treasure of children everywhere. When the fair is over, the city comes down, the rivers rise again, and the land returns to agricultural marsh. Anything left over, including human waste and chemicals, merges with the already polluted but revered and holy rivers as they flow on toward the Bay of Bengal and the sea. During the festival, up to 30 million people at a time are said to converge on this small space of just about nine square miles. Thousands of Hindu sadhus, holy men, and a few holy women live on site and teach, bathe, hold councils, and carry out their regular religious practices. The event is both worship and festival. Many pilgrims walk from home as far as they're able, often with nothing more than the clothes on their back. They come to the river seeking release from the endless cycle of reincarnation. We find here none of the Protestant Christian certainty that one dip does it all. Bathing at the Comella is repetitive, with many coming to the river early each morning. Not surprisingly, public health concerns have marked the event throughout modern history. The Com has been associated with cholera epidemics and fatal stampedes. The marshland is home to mosquitoes carrying malaria and dengue fever. Other risks include fire, theft, swindling, and just getting lost in the crowds. There are many ways one might go to this event and die, and in fact, many do seriously go expecting to die. But happily for us, the government is committed to good international public relations, and the state funds police, these are some of the things they do, um, lifeguards, daily DDT blasts, and health clinics. Temporary workers sprinkle sanitiz sanitizing bleach powder on the roads and toilet areas, and temporary bore wells provide drinking water. Hindu NGOs and volunteers provide free meals in the religious camps and a system for those who get lost or abandoned. The PA system is on constantly from 3 a.m. to 11 p.m. with religious teachings and announcements that you can hear for miles. Through it all, the center the central focus is on the river, this remarkably filthy but eternally pure and holy redemptive space. Now I was there as part of a cross-university initiative, a project that is looking at what the Qum might teach about the intersections between public health, urban design, business, and religious studies, especially related to urbanization and humanitarian emergencies. And when our faculty director, who is a physician, asked if I would go, I thought, why me? But she said, you've been to divinity school, why not? <laughs> As I was getting my visa and all the shots, I kept thinking, how can I wrap my mind around this experience? It is so far from my own religious tradition as a Christian. But is it? In fact, the festival invites comparative discussion about exactly the topics we're considering here, public health, as it relates to poverty and history, as it relates to how religions respond to human need. As I travel through the fair in my own skin, as a person of another faith, religion was what I saw first. So I began to think more and again about the Christian past and about how pilgrimage relates to health. I'd like to draw these issues together tonight by looking very broadly at three themes. First, pilgrimage for health, especially related to social justice in Christian antiquity. The first half of the paper focuses on the past, and of course these are not just Christian issues. I look forward to comments from those of you who work in other traditions. And second, moving across borders between patristics and public health, how do we read the past to inform the present? Can reading patristic texts be practical? Can it be translational? And third, faith-based responses to health issues and poverty as they engage today with human rights and the gifts and sharing concepts that draw on ideas about community-based assets. The talk, as you can see, is shamelessly broad, but I hope it might encourage dialogue and further study across these critically important relationships of ideas and actions. But first, a couple of definitions. By health, I have in mind this classic definition from the World Health Organization, health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This is obviously an ideal. It's what we're working toward. 
Public health is, um, a, this is a classic definition of public health from 1923, which I will not read at length. One physician I know who um, focuses on emergency medicine, so he, he's into being short, summarizes it with what you see on the bottom. Disease effects within a population as they inform public policy and programming. And third, global health. Global health is not the same as public health, although obviously they're both related to health across the world today, including health at the local level. I think of global health as a sort of three-dimensional, um, multi-connected network of risks, so, uh, social relationships, and opportunities. This is the description that's on our website, um, which again, I won't read at length, but it's uh, just the middle part, and the end is actually worth m contemplating um, that global health as, as a focus on the health effects of globalization, the interconnectedness of populations, and the transfer of risks across national borders. Of central concern is the distribution of health, which illuminates disparities between and within countries, giving equity a key position on the global health agenda. So a global health vision includes a multidisciplinary collaboration of people in business, religious studies, engineering, architects, philosophers, artists, poets, and so forth. People like you, like your students, um, all of us. These definitions all focus on the present. That's how generally people in health-related areas think. But for our purposes, I'd like to add a small phrase to this definition, and that is that global health issues also cross time. Religious history is relevant to it because the past shapes the present and the future. Our health and risks today depend on all that shaped us, where we are and where we come from. To address world health today, we need people who can see things like social determinants of health across time and who can think creatively about the past to scope out the big picture. So let's look now at some examples from the past related to pilgrimage and social justice. Social justice is often part of pilgrimage stories about travel to the holy across history. And Simeon the Stylite, for example, it was one of the most spectacular early Christian attractions for pilgrims. He was perched atop a 60-foot pillar for 40 years in 5th century Edessa. Simeon practiced public prayer as he also dispensed food, medicine, and justice. Each afternoon he taught and heard disputes sitting in judgment and handing down proper and just sentences. His views on money lending would appeal to the modern Jubilee movement as he called for loan interests of a half a percent per month or six percent per year, often urging people to forgive the interest entirely. As Susan Ashbrook Harvey has noted, Simeon's body bore the truth of the world he saw, the suffering, the terror, the weariness, and the radiance of transfigured grace. Now, not everyone who climbed pillars had Simeon's focus. A 7th century Chinese travel narrative by a Buddhist monk, Huyen Tsang, describes ascetic heretics, which he means non-Buddhists, uh, climbing a pillar in the Ganges River in India in Allahabad. Huyen Tsang went to India looking for manuscripts, and his travelogue is the oldest reference we have to perhaps an earlier version of the Comella Festival. In the middle of the river, on a high column, he says, dozens of ascetics climb each day at sunset, at sun, yes, at sunset, hang their bodies out over the river while holding on with one hand and one foot and gaze into the sun until it gets dark and then climb down. Their hope, he says, is, quote, to escape from birth and death, Unquote. and many follow this practice daily for decades. He also describes another event on the sand between the rivers here in what, was, what he calls a great charity enclosure. He says that's what it is called. Here, the rich and noble gather wherever they had occasion to di distribute their gifts in charity. The local king leads off in a gigantic potlatch-type divestment. He starts with donations to a statue of Buddha, then he distributes the rest by descending social rank to the priests, then to leaders, then heretics, again, sort of lay people, and lastly, to the widows and bereaved orphans and desolate poor and mendicants. Then, after the poor clean out the bottom of the barrel, the king cries with joy, well done, 
Now all that I have has entered into incorruptible and imperishable treasuries, unquote. Now if this sounds a bit like the New Testament, it may be because the Chinese text was translated into English in 1869 by a British chaplain of Queen Victoria's Royal Navy. But if we expect the king, the Indian king, to run off and become an Antony or a Simeon in the desert, we are in for a surprise. For after this radical divestment, Huyen Sang tells us, quote, the rulers of the different countries then offer their jewels and ropes to the king so that his treasury is replenished. This expansive gift exchange seems a bit unrelated to poverty relief or justice and perhaps more about the ascetic value of detachment. The large-scale local investment in a public display and religious exchange, however, actually matches the spirit of the modern Komela festival uh, quite remarkably. And yet we know Buddhist charity in India also included health care very similar to early Christian models. 200 years earlier, Fa Xian, another Buddhist priest who was wandering through India in the early 5th century, describes how, quote, benevolent and educated persons, unquote, launched a free hospital that served the poor with food, medicine, and comfortable healing care. Free healthcare services are part of the Qum today and were also linked to faith-based travel in Christian antiquity. As 7th century pilgrims were hanging from their pillar in the Ganges, Christians in Egypt were creating this room at the Monastery of the Syrians, um, a site that Duke Professor Lucas Van Rompe has been involved in, so talk to him if you want to know more. The frescoes depict popular holy doctors such as St. Cyrus, Cosmas and Damien, St. Luke, and an unnamed eye doctor. Here, healing shrines elide with hospitals as the sick Christian body received therapy that included food, drink, bathing, worship, and often bizarre or startling treatments that forced the patient into the saint's view of right moral relationship with the holy and the other. In the Christian poorhouse, sorry about the resolution on that, uh, we also find a focus on civic as well as religious justice. A quick glimpse at three examples. Um, these are just examples. There, there are others. John the Almsgiver in Alexandria in the 7th century built lying in hospitals for poor women who had recently given birth, who he found starving during a festival. It says in his, uh, his story, each facility had 40 beds and allowed a woman to rest for seven days and go home with a small cash gift from the bishop. During the Persian invasions, he ordered that the wounded and sick should be put to bed in hostels and hospitals, which he himself had founded, and that they should receive care and medical treatment without payment. These medical <coughs> services developed from his daily handouts to the poor, in which healthy men, it says, received one coin apiece, and healthy women and children two coins, as being weaker members. This is one of the few patristic texts I know that suggests privileging the economic support of poor women over men. In Syria, Bishop Rabula uh, also shaped his social actions and health service in terms of justice rather than charity. He ordered what we might call good public health and sanitation standards for hospital patients, clean sheets, and regular trained caregivers. His entire ministry was characterized by a radical divestment, arguing that the poor are sustained not by what belongs to us, but by the justice, zedakto, or righteousness of God. This word is, of course, the same root word as the Hebrew tzedakah, which means both righteousness and alms or charity. It implies an assumption about human entitlement that is related to the created order and the nature of God. And third, Basil of Caesarea's 4th century initiative we know about from his sermons, letters, and contemporary texts about him. These descriptions uh, about the Basil or poorhouse are very general, and we have no real sense of statistics or even case studies. He built and staffed the poorhouse as part of his Episcopal complex during, um, following a severe famine and drought, and he clearly used the crisis to his own political advantage to establish his own authority as a, as a generous civic patron. Uh, he built the facility on family land, he bought up local grain, donated it to the starving, and provided aid in direct personal encounters. 
residents there were also given some type of employment and there's one letter that suggests it was also a traditional hospice or sort of bed and breakfast for those who came from a distance to consult the bishop. Texts can only tell us so much about social inequities and justice from the past. Surviving buildings, bones, and teeth can tell us a little more. This building is a 13th, an early 13th century Islamic structure known as the Gavhar Nasibe complex in modern uh, Kaiseri, which is ancient, was ancient Caesarea, so the, the town of Basel of Caesarea. It has not been linked to Basel, as far as I know. Yet, like Basel's hospital, it's, today it's a museum, it too is said to be a little outside the city walls. It too included a hospital and a religious space, as well as a medical school. Like Basel's poorhouse, it rose out of a donor's commitment to serve the poor for free. We don't exactly know where in relation to the modern city Basel built his structure, but you can't help wonder what late Roman foundations might lie beneath this Islamic complex, but you can't dig up a city. At the very least, the complex reminds us that health concerns may continue in the same general historical location even where they cross religious borders. Evidence from human bones and teeth may also point towards a biology of inequality in the ancient world. And there's, there's massive amounts of, of, of research on this. And so what I've given you here is just a tiny, tiny sample uh, of data from two communities that were discussed at a recent conference at Harvard Divinity School. Anthropologist Tracy Prouse, for example, has used data from carbon and nitrogen isotopes and dental evidence to examine the health of people in what was probably a worker's graveyard on an imperial Roman estate. One third of the bones were children ages zero to six. One third were adults aged 15 to 50 roughly. Carbon nitrogen proportions suggest, she says, that the men's diet was likely a little higher than pro, uh, in protein than the women's. She also found gender differences in healing, in healed fractures with men's uh, breaking bones in their lower limbs and women more often in the chest and upper limbs. Men's teeth had significantly more cavities than women, which too points to diet, since we know cavities are more likely when you eat <laughs> frequently or eat or drink a lot of foods that are high in sticky or sweet carbohydrates. And Luigi Capasso, a physician who has worked on the human remains from Pompeii and Herculaneum, also identified dietary and health factors in this population. For example, he found sand in bread that could explain dental wear, a high content of the natural antibiotic streptomycin, but only in dried pomegranates and figs. He found bone evidence of brucellosis, which is from exposure to infected cows in their milk, uh, also isolated um, a single louse in the hair of a 25-year-old pregnant woman who was likely from the rich upper class by her hair, hairstyle, and evidence of chronic lung infection that suggests indoor air pollution that would have been uh, direct from the carbon byproducts of burning lamps and cook fires. So while most of his findings cannot be linked directly to the social class of affected individuals, he did see clear work-related asymmetric bone lesions. Um, for example, this bone on the right is, uh, dr shows a drastic stress caused to the right cost costoclavicular ligament in an eight-year-old child. Such wear happens after prolonged heavy manual labor that affects the muscle group on the shoulder and head. So this child would have perhaps been involved with heavy um, agricultural tilling of the fields or rowing the boats. The Roman boats had one oar, uh, so that would explain wear on one side of your shoulder and not the other. There are, of course, interpretive limits to such evidence, but these bone studies remind us that the individual body was shaped literally by its culture as it absorbed the material world. Such research emphasizes the role of cross-disciplinary work for cultural history about health. So clearly, the religious past can entertain us. But how might we use it to think about poverty and public health today? Historical transmission of patristic texts and ideas about justice and social welfare is stained, colored, and reformatted by generations of users. This is, uh, I think, an 8th century, 9th century Greek, um, Greek manuscript. 
We have remnants, the products of selective cutting and accidental survival. Whether we read the remnants as scholars, activists, or pastors, we need to read with sensitivity and caution, if only to be fair to a moral ethic to respect and rightly represent these voices of human beings speaking across time. In God Knows There's Need in 2009, I developed some specific suggestions that were intended as a very basic guide for such reading, and I'll quickly summarize them here. First, uh, the four suggestions for reading were um, start by looking for trouble. Be sensitive to what bothers you in the text. That's actually a mouse that just wandered across my kitchen floor and died inexplicably. <laughs> So look for trouble. What, what, what's the story here? Uh, second, see the frame. Know the cultural context. Third, read gender. Look for women and children where they are missed. And fourth, recognize diversity in the sources. You can't say, oh, the patristic texts say X about X because there's a lot, these are different voices. These are historical human voices, conversation partners who like ourselves had quirks, differences, and many variant views. I also suggested that we might enter into su understanding such texts through three paradigms or three ideas that are common to both ancient texts and our modern views. Uh, the first is sensing need, that is tune in to what's happening before you do anything. And that's especially for those of us that care about poverty, etc. The, there's this knee jerk reaction to want to act, but the, you can't responsibly act unless you know what on earth is out there. Second, sharing the world. That is, look at the exchange process and what it tells us about values and culture. And third, embodying sacred kingdom, which um, a very wise nun said, maybe you should put a parenthesis around the G so that we can think in terms of kingdom as well. That is, recognizing the eschatological or endpoint ideal that informs these religious opinions about the human body and work to appreciate why it makes specific social behaviors into a religious interaction, however that's defined. So now turning from these stories from the past, an interpretive method, where does the rubber meet the road in our own world? Faith-based organizations today act in conversation with many different religious and secular views. Where might we find ourselves talking about these stories and ideas? Where are the translational challenges on the ground? And this is for those of you in the seminar. I want you to tell me <laughs> afterwards. Um, there are many, of course, but I'd like to focus on just two, human rights and gift exchange or sharing concepts within the idea of community-based assets. And I've kind of merged the gift exchange and assets concept just because just they seem to go together in this discussion. If religious gifts are controversial in public health, the topic of human rights is perhaps equally contentious in faith-based settings. Human rights is probably the most contentious idea that you might encounter um, in, in this particular setting, and it's impossible to avoid talking about rights in public health. Most public and global health efforts today affirm a human rights framework. This gives us, I think, the opportunity to think about how we should and how we might connect them <coughs> with these seemingly radically different stories from the past. Now, the word human rights is used to mean many different things. And here, I mean it very intentionally outside its narrow legal meaning of laws. International legal documents are certainly part of the conversation. But here, I mean rights conceived in the context of social justice activities. Um, entitlements intrinsic to one's humanness. One physician I know simply calls them things that apply to all people everywhere, all the time, equally. Uh, she works in global crises where there is no time to quibble over why they matter. I'm focusing further only on the human entitlements to food, water, housing, and health, and work, what we call economic, social, and cultural, or ESC rights. Most patristic texts about the poor actually echo many of the same economic and social concerns that we find in Article 25 of the 1948 Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Both share a sense of imperative. The needy must rightly receive food equity, health care, fair access to drinking water, debt resolution and relief, 
fair employment practices, preservation of family inheritance related to property, and adequate housing. Patristic authors differ, of course, by talking quite a lot about God, and they often have underlying assumptions about social status and position that we may have um, differences with. But they share the UDHR focus on aid as, as justified on the basis of justice and the nature of reality and the human person. Now among the patristic texts, and this is how I got into human rights, um, almost against my will once I realized how charged people got about the issues, uh, there is at least one rather explicit appeal to human rights in the fourth century in Gregory of Nazianz's sermon on homeless and diseased beggars. He calls for Christians to imitate the esotase, that is, equality or even-handedness of God. One translator calls it the justice of God. He also used the word isonomia, a Greek political term that could mean either equity or equality of rights. Appealing here to the Garden of Eden before the fall, Gregory wrote, I would have you look back to our primary equality of rights, not the later diversity. As far as you can, support nature, honor primeval liberty, show reverence for yourself and cover the shame of your race or genos, help to resist sickness, offer relief to human need. While this text is especially clear in its appeal to something called rights, um, other authors also defined the human person as having equal worth, at least before God, and roundly condemned inequities. Another a, a contemporary of, the, of Gregory and Basil, Asterius of Amasia, for example, regarded material inequality, which he called anomalia, from which we get anomaly, as innately unjust. Covetousness, said Asterius, creates, quote, a marked disparity in the conditions of life between human persons created equal in worth, unquote. I'm currently, as part of a bigger project, looking at the history of just this one article, um, this one, uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as it relates to ESC rights, because these are really the essence of faith-based social justice. And what keeps shining through, at least in the history of the UDHR, as it relates just to this article, is how much religious history did influence those who wrote the UDHR. Uh, John Humphrey, the Canadian lawyer who wrote the first draft, was not a, he was a, I think he was an agnostic, um, but he drew on research that looked back at centuries of ethical standards, laws, and cultural norms, many of them rooted in religious perspectives. René Cassin, who most influenced the final document, was a French Jew who had lost most of his extended family to the Holocaust. The UDHR's text was also profoundly shaped by P.C. Chang, a Chinese philosopher on Chinese and Buddhist thought, Charles Malik, a devout Lebanese Christian who taught in a setting of Francophone Islam and Christian Orthodoxy, and Jacques Maritain, a Catholic shaped by his study on Thomas Aquinas. When it came to ESC rights explicitly, Humphrey later noted, quote, the two special interests that have tried hardest to influence the Declaration are the Catholic Church and the Communist Party, the former with considerably more success than the latter, unquote. Now, as many of you know, the UDHR actually has no legal power. It floats above all local and regional contingencies and is a statement of more or less abstract moral rights and principles. Yet, legal historian Hearst Hannum did a survey of all national and international law uh, that showed its real influence to be absolutely immense. It has shaped dozens of international documents that do have real legal power to address what the UDHR founders called the moral gap. The result is that many find human rights rhetoric idolized and problematic as a modern secular creed and there remain deep ideological differences over why any particular right should be taken seriously. But for our focus here on basic public health issues, most major world ethical systems do value and teach practices that support a moral entitlement to food, water, health care, and some form of social protection. If we are people who care of, of faith, who care about poverty, the similarities may seem more important to our lived practice than the differences are to their underlying philosophies. 
Bastigay Fortman is perhaps one of the most encouraging modern voices on religion in ESC rights today. He is a, a Dutch Christian Protestant diplomat and scholar at Utrecht. Although, uh, he says, faith-based approaches to human rights cannot be of universal character, these distinct perspectives do not necessarily affect the universal nature of human rights as such. At the same time, such linking to the sources of faith and the equal dignity and worth of women and their inherent freedoms and responsibilities may play a vital part in establishing a genuine global human rights constituency. Fortman also draws on the 1992 Latin American bishops' endorsement of human rights to emphasize how much rights concepts have in, co in common with the three Abrahamic religions. He points explicitly to the biblical idea of tzedakah, a word that has the same meaning in its Hebrew, Christian Syriac, and Arabic cognates. Thus, as Fortman puts it, quote, the connection with religion may provide the necessary cultural basis for the struggle for economic, social, and cultural rights, unquote. The justice of ESC rights was further affirmed in the 2008 Russian Orthodox Bishops' Council on Human Dignity, Freedom, and Rights, summarized here. And, and I'll read it just, just because it's, it's another voice, and it's a voice specifically from a faith-based group. They, say, they concluded the church stresses the legitimacy of property rights, the right to work, the protection from employers' malpractice, but also the legitimacy of the right of free enterprise, entrepreneurship as well as the right to a decent quality of life. Yet the stipulation that these rights are legitimate is to keep their moral dimension central and hence to assert the inferiority of rights to religious goals. The crucial issue of these rights is to prevent confrontation and disparity in society. And, and just as, as a reiteration, it took them 10 years to, to decide on this. Um, that's church history for you. I'd like to move now to the second common approach that shapes our contemporary faith-based action, the ideas of gift sharing and non-economic assets. And here we find the focus on community, faith, on, um, community exchange and mutual interaction a view that is summarized in this rather well-known phrase of, uh, saying from Basil of Caesarea, which is actually, it's a gloss on Aristotle. Uh, he said, Basil writes, the word orders us to share and to love one another in natural kinship. And that's actually the Aristotle. And then he goes on. After all, kinship, humankind is a civic, oh, actually I think, humankind is a civic and social or gregarious animal. Uh, liberality for the purpose of restoration is a necessary part of the common life and helping one another upward. And, and I, I, w I went back at one point and looked at this and looked at all of the sort of texts that came before it and um, it's not clear where Basil learned his Aristotle but it's clear that he was deeply influenced by, by this concept. In context, this is about the community's responsibility to avoid excessive debt but it's usually applied broadly to the ideas of the common good. Uh, so we have Aristotle starts this, well, or at least creates the, the first part of the phrase that we still have, and then we have Basil in 400, three, you know, the 300s, and then Thomas Aquinas actually lifts and cites this, this passage verbatim in the 13th century, which, because of his influence, indirectly influences his own later readers, including the Dominicans. So that's sort of a, one example of how texts can have an influence over centuries. The assets-based approach to community development emerged from a group at Northwestern in the early 1990s, uh, by, and the book here is by John Kretzman and John L. McKnight. It was not specifically a Christian uh, perspective, but it quickly entered Christian discourse as a new tool for being with those in need. While an assets-based approach may assume a human rights framework in terms of justice and equity, it focuses more on social and spiritual capacity than on rights entitlement. The group itself discovers and applies its own resources to get what it needs. It may be political or not. It's not about the system, but it's about how people can act within it. The assets-based approach takes many forms today. It's, it's not a fixed... Uh, in stone 
thing. It's, it's, it's an idea that many people have sort of taken and built on. One physician in Haiti, for example, blends this approach with a commitment to liberation theology and emphasizes the value of what he calls solidarity-based assets. The most textured example I know is the African Religious Health Assets Program. Um, RHAP was found at RHAP African Religious Health Assets Program, and actually all of their, they're now called the, I think, International Religious Health Assets Program, and the, all of their material is totally free, available online. Uh, they were formed in early 2002 when three religion professors in southern Africa teamed up with public health faculty at Emory, together with key stakeholders at the World Health Organization. And some of the key leaders behind this were also public health people involved in religious, um, religious activities or who had friends who were doing both. And so there was a very interesting trail of um, connections. The goal of RHAP was to understand the growing but often ignored ro role of religion in healthcare delivery in settings of extreme poverty, particularly in but not limited to the global response to HIV AIDS and to identify the religious health assets that communities use to respond to the crisis. RHAP teams traveled across the remote mountains of Lesotho and into urban neighborhoods in Zambia to map responses literally into a GPS system. They also listened and documented detailed first-person narratives from representatives of 500 religious and partner organizations who were active in healthcare activities. So they were going around finding them and then finding what they were doing and finding out what they had to say about um, the assets that they were offering their communities. The initial research led to further work that was funded by the Gates Foundation, the Tears Fund, UNAIDS, and the RHAP research affiliates remained and still remain today committed to ensure that results reflect the collective knowledge and deep wisdom of participants who work in a daily struggle for survival. It's a collaboration across disciplines that continues uh, today through the Emory and South Africa faculty. And I, I go on at length about it because I think it's, it's just one example of the kind of sensitive listening between religion and development people that Catherine Marshall uh, called for in her talk here a few weeks ago. Just, she talked a lot about how the difficulty, the difficulty of that conversation. So there it's, it's very heartening to see some examples where that conversation is going on and, and is being nurtured. Now I'd like to end with a story from the first RHAP report. In the 2006 interviews, we find a Zambian pastor who describes this health-related dilemma and how local religious assets made a difference. He says, we had a patient who was sick, a church member, and we prayed for her for two weeks, and each time there was no improvement. Until one time, the Spirit of God says, can you just ask if she's eaten anything? So I asked, Madam, have you eaten anything? And she says, how can I get anything? So the church decided to do something. In the afternoon, they all went and brought her this and that, such as a bag of maize meal. And the very next morning, she was healed. This story is intriguing at several levels. The woman has turned her church for the only solution she can count on, which is prayer. And the community does what she asks. It prays. And yet it takes the Spirit of God to nudge someone with that very mundane question about matter itself. Has she eaten? Hunger is so normative for her and presumably those around her that nobody noticed she was starving. Once the question goes public, the church sees its internal assets and acts. We don't know much about this woman's illness and her healing, but we do know how hunger works. We know that chronic hunger, her malnutrition, makes her more likely to die if she gets sick. We know that she's a poor woman in a poor country with likely poor sanitation and water. Basic hygiene, sanitation, and water are low-cost solutions that can make a big difference to health. 
a 2012 Food and Agricultural Organization report on the state of food insecurity in the world today estimates that about 870 million people remain chronically malnourished with about 850 million of those living in developing nations. The report argues that economic growth is necessary but not sufficient. The poor must participate, they note, and change absolutely requires improved governance systems based on transparency, participation, accountability, rule of law, and human rights. That's quoting them. And we know also that chronic starvation has a domino effect as the starving body makes it hard to focus, hard to learn, and hard to find the energy to act or realize one's best potential, perpetuating chronic inequities. Now, we may think that this woman's church should have noticed that she was starving. I mean, why did they need the Spirit of God for something so obvious? But poverty and hunger are so common that they, might, they may be all but invisible to communities themselves. The church could afford to pray. But providing food was more costly, requiring more awareness at a higher level of interaction. Unfortunately, even multinational secular NGOs who bring innovative health care and health care delivery methods to poor countries rarely consider food and nutrition in their essential provision of health care services. Why should we expect faith communities to be different? Help for this woman did not depend on international long-distance charity. We hear about it because her pastor told the story as an example of the community's internal religious resources for health. But still the problem had to be voiced, becoming a public issue for discussion at the local level before it could draw on local assets and responses based on, quote, this and that. Perhaps the critical religious asset in this story is its community voice. In conclusion, it has been said that, quote, visits to the other can result in the confluence of images that will never be erased from memory, too complex for neat and rigid categorization. And this was certainly true from my experience in India in January. The complexity of health, too, is far broader than just a subcategory of medicine and science, as people at Duke know absolutely. It is influenced by intersectoral connections that affect groups, communities, and populations across geographical boundaries or politics and across history, across time. Faith-based responses to health and poverty issues are connected with all that we are as human beings, relationships, risks, and opportunities for comparative learning. Catherine Marshall, as you can tell, I really enjoyed her talk, um, pointed eloquently here a few weeks ago to the selective vision that shapes how secular actors in development hear or mostly don't hear what religious voices are really saying. Perhaps we might use stories from the past to provoke thinking outside the box about contemporary situations. And then together, perhaps, we can draw creative new maps between past and present, sacred and secular, as we work together towards a vision of global health. Thank you. Absolutely, and now I can see you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so in the readings and in your talk, you've uh, mentioned the um, sort of different motivations between uh, modern secular um, aid and public health organizations and more religiously based homes. Um, and Catherine Marshall, uh, the noted the fact that uh, there's a lot of mistrust between these two um, camps, primarily around the issue of uh, proselytizing and uh, sort of evangelism being mixed into one or the other. Um, and from, you know, patristic tradition, from, you know, the early church fathers to, uh, I mean, even up to uh, the you know, newest pope, um, there's been a lot of emphasis on if you're not working uh, specifically in the name of Christ, though you're not really doing God's work in a, in a genuine way. Um, uh, is there any way to get these kind of camps to uh, uh, work together despite this kind of looming elephant in the room? Or do you think it's even as big an issue as uh, people make it out to be in the first place? Well, I think there are 
different, uh, different faith-based organizations answer that question differently. Um, I, the, the whole question of what is it to witness to Christ if, if you're a Christian faith-based organization or what, what, what does it mean to represent whatever you believe to be true um, and there, I think I think that this problem he focuses on words in, in so many ways. I mean, we're kind of so dependent on well, if I don't tell the gospel, or but there are so many. I think that there's a, a number of and actually, is it Francis of Assisi who the, the new pope took as his name, um, who talks about. actually living not by words but by actions. I can't remember this is a wonderful quote about it. But so yeah, I think that I think it depends on the group. I mean it depends on actually it depends on what people are coming from. Um, a few weeks ago I actually sat down in a lecture next to um someone hadn't met before and it turned out that she was a, a doctor, emergency doctor, who spent most of her um, free time doing emergency, doing, volunteering her time in third world countries. And she was, she's not a religious person and I, and I told her that I wrote about caring about religious responses to poverty and the very, very, very first thing she said was, I hate religious groups. Which is, you know, that's where the polarization is. There's these, there's in the field, there's groups that sort of, they go in assuming that the other is going to be a certain stereotype that maybe they've experienced in their childhood from their, you know, other mission trips or, you know, whatever their own background is. And, and I think a lot of it is just conversation is the only way forward. It's just individual. What do, why do you? I talk to the person, why do you think this is a difficult issue? Because I'm, each of us can respond about how we, we have, if, if we have a faith position, we can't take that hat off and not be a person of faith, but that doesn't mean we have to talk about it. So yeah, there's, that doesn't really answer your question directly, but I think it depends on the context. I think there's no easy answer, but a lot is just conversations. I think that's really important. That's yes, yes. Um, there are tensions, and there are tensions in groups on the ground. I, and and I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm a scholar, so I work with the texts rather than in the field. So I'm very sensitive to the fact that 
those of you, many of you, who have actually been years and years and years with, um, with at the front forefront of these issues, uh, can speak to to that those tensions perhaps more more cogently in terms of the specifics. But definitely there are tensions, um, and the patristic texts, which I can speak to, the patristic texts consistently emphasize that the person that you're serving, and again, it's a charity model in many cases, um, even in the sense of justice, but the person you're serving, it's not a matter, there's an, I, I can't even think of, a, of, an, of an occasion where you're required to, to talk about your faith to these people. I mean, in Christendom, in the Cappadocians, there's, uh, the focus is on relieving the body's needs. The focus is not on perpetuating a particular message, but then they're, they're acting out of a position of power too. And in their other part of their lives, they're often condemning wealth. So, so there is, and there's a real emphasis on the poor as, um, as, as embodied Christ. There's definitely the image of, this is a representation of, of, of Christ, and this is sort of the Mother Teresa model, which we might have problems with in that they're not treating these people as human beings um, for their own value. But there's, there's never a sense that they have to convert. Um, these, are not, these are not rice Christian concepts. Um, but definitely there's been a lot of I mean, co the controversies throughout history and over where where hospitals were built. Um, I think in the fourth century there was a, ten a tension. Chrysostom had a leprosarium in that was there was a tension over whether it was inside or outside the city walls and the, that the theological tensions of the time fed into that fifth, fifth century he would have been so yeah lots of lots of tensions so you can you can encourage that and build on those ideas maria On Syriac texts, so if you have questions about Syriac texts, talk to Maria. <laughs> and other things. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, the, well, the idea of the rich to the poor raises the whole question of how, how does that interaction happen? And if it's the relatively ri rich to the relatively poor, where are those people living? And what, how are they finding out about each other? What, um, how are they envisioning their, the process of that exchange? And what kind of politics would be involved in that exchange? What kind of perspective? I mean, is it a matter of someone joining their church's um, 
pantry and just sort of sitting at a table in the church hall every week and serving the people who come in for stuff from the church pantry or are they thinking of actually moving into the neighborhood and changing their whole you know life style um, it's it's a huge challenge in terms of what how does that interaction happen and how does it happen how can we think of it happening in a way that is responsible and respectful um, and, and uh, that's why the assets model which is really only one of many models kind of speaks it speaks to me as a, a reminder that this is not just about money this is not just about, okay, I have X amount of money and that person can't pay their rent. So the solution will be just make sure that person or those group of people have the money they need and make sure that the channel that you make sure the, gets the money to them is responsible. I mean, it's not just about money. It's about so much more. Um, it's, it's really, and, and this is something that's in the patristic text is a focus on looking at the other, looking at the other as a human person and not being afraid to touch them, not being afraid to engage with them, um, spending time with them. This is the, especially in the health texts. So, so certainly the, the wealth issue, and the wealth issue is a big issue in today because we hear so much about Christian groups, especially that don't use donations wisely or use them dishonestly um, just I mean, if you're looking for nightmare stories that will make you never want to give they're not very hard to find so yeah it, it, it raises the wealth raises a huge range of questions but and it also comes down to the question of what is enough and I mean what is poverty but thank you other questions? 